Hey everybody, JD here, and thanks for tuning in again. A lot going on in the uh, ocean and river salmon season setting process right now in California. A lot of people have been really uh, hitting us up for questions about it. So um, we're going to get an update here in just a second from James Stone, president of NorCal Guides and Sportsman Association. And um, there's a lot going on, and uh, he's the man to tell us all about it. So let's just, without further ado, bring him in. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How you doing? I'm good. You guys, how's everybody out there? Yeah, I'm sure everybody's good. Now, uh, I want to remind everybody that down in the comments, you can um, ask James questions and uh, or me questions, but he's going to know more than me. So, um, so just to kind of set this up, you've been how many days at PFMC now? I think we're at like five so far. And then the council broke over the weekend. Um, and even though they broke over the weekend, uh, a lot of members of the public and the SAS continued to have dialogue over this weekend. And uh, we're kind of taking a day off today um, for the most part. But there's still sidebar conversations from the general public, which anyone's uh, I represent all of the California Ocean uh, recreational community and uh, inland communities. So if uh, anyone wants to have any input, they can always give me a call and uh, give me their input and I can push, put it forth for you through the public process to the other SAS members. All right, cool. One of our uh, board members, Jason Thatcher, just uh, texted me and says, I need a tan. Maybe it's just too much light. Let's see here. Is that better? Well, now it's almost worse. <laughs> I'm sitting in front of my window and there's snow outside. Come on, man. I've got this. I, here. I got the sun blazing in here, too. And I didn't know. Uh, I don't know. I did a Zoom conference the other day with uh, my stuffed animals uh, behind me and I, I offended somebody. So I'm uh, oh, back in front of the uh, back in front of the windows now. <laughs> yeah. OK, so. Um, well, let's uh, let's jump into it again. Oh well, hang on. We got a couple of comments here. Let's just see if there's anything we can get to. Uh, listening from the Sack River right now says Carson Hicks. That's cool. Yeah, thank you very much, very much, Casey. And thanks for all your support, uh, America. <laughs> so anyway, um, all right. So what's the latest? Uh, what are you What are you hearing? Um, and I've got some graphs that you sent me. Uh, so if you want me to pop one of those up, just let me know. Um, yeah. Why don't we, why don't we start with uh, kind of just a recap of where we did last time? You know about what happened last year, and then you can pop up that graph of escapement for the last twenty years. Okay. Uh, so basically, in the you know we had low escapement in the Sacramento Valley again this year, folks, in twenty twenty. Um, and sorry to interrupt you, but let's let's do the uh, the definition of escapement again. Just yeah, absolutely on board. I always tell JD to just reel me back in because I will go way off. <laughs> yeah, way off on a tangent. There's just too much uh, salmon stuff in this head now. Um, anyhow, uh, escapement is the definition of a salmon that escapes from the ocean. So they either make it back to the hatchery to count towards escapement and their eggs are milked or used, or they spawn naturally or given the opportunity to spawn naturally in a river. So it's basically a fish that's made it back, done its, done its thing and it's got a chance to uh, do its uh, reproductive duty, whether it's enhanced by uh, humans or not. Yeah, and this is a hatchery fish. We're not talking fish farms, everyone. I had some people privately talk to me about fish farms. We don't do any of that in California where the fish are raised their entire lives in a pen, except for protecting the winter run brood stock, which they're, they sit in tanks, circular tanks for years on end for their whole lives to protect <laughs> genetics in a circular tank. Yeah. Um, 
another topic for another day. Yeah, but yeah, right. Okay, so oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to pop up the graph. Escapement was low last year. Uh, the uh, you know great great graph you can put up there, and you can see that the 2020 Upper Sacramento Basin was uh, below a historical average, and we're on another downcline again. Looks like we came up to our highest level, uh, you know, barely over, you know, not even to a hundred thousand fish on the sack, and then now we're starting to decline again. Right. The feather has been staying a little bit more consistent the last few years. And I really want to explain why that is and why we're going to see a huge drop off on the feather starting this year and next year. Um, and I don't think people understand that, but that's because we lowered hatchery production 33% from brood year 2017, which was 9 million fall runs Chinook, which was 6 million for mitigation, 1 million for the salmon stamp, and then 2 million for NorCal guides and sportsmen because of the Orville spillway crisis, which we want to thank DWR and CDFW again. Thank you so much right. for finally listening. And the graph this year, which we're going to put up in this show to show you what those fish contributed to the ocean fishery this year in 2020 was just phenomenal, substantial. So I've had a couple of ocean guys get mad at me because of our videos and letters saying that we need to have our fish come back to the rivers. But I need you guys to realize that I'm fighting for all of us and JD is and our organization is 100%. This isn't an attack on any fishery. This is uh if I've got to awaken you about what's going on on the spawning grounds and what we're seeing with our baby salmon as they're trying to get out, we're just trying to tell you the truth. And, you know, people can perceive it how they want. But the truth is, is that we're in a very, very bad decline right now. And the people that think that fishing's good right now haven't been around long enough to realize what fishing used to be. That's that's a fact. Um I think I have that graph here. Is this the one you were talking about? Yeah, so that's a that's a good start graph. And these graphs all got released by the Department of Fish and Wildlife through uh, the salmon information meeting in February that happens every year. This graph basically depicts that the contribution from hatchery fish, 78% of them were recreational ocean harvest. So, I mean, that goes to show you that almost eight in 10 salmon uh, came, you know, from our feather, Sa Coleman, or Nimbus hatchery. Um, and then the other 18% are McCallamy. And you can see that uh, there's not many natural spawning, you know, I mean, this is a graph of ha hatchery only, but you can see how important our hatchery fish are in the Sacramento Valley. They make up of 80% 80, 80 of commercial and recreational harvest. But if you wanted to go to the next one that I showed, I mean, talk about it real quick. Yeah, that's the slide. Um, so this slide right here just shows you that out of that 78 to 82%, uh, if you look at that, Feather River contributed to 50% of all ocean harvest last year wow. for out of, the, out of the hatcheries. And that's never, you know, I don't want to say it's never been done, but I think it's very rare. It's normally Coleman, you know, because Coleman raises 12 million fish. Feather only raised, you know, 9 million this year, or according to this graph, three years ago, brood year uh, 2017. Uh, they raised 9 million. But now brood year 2018, which comes back this fall in 2021, we're only at 6 million fish. So watch this graph, everyone, if you don't believe me, but just uh, hold your breath, wait one year, and I'll bet you this graph drops next year. And the exactly. will only make up a certain amount of contribution to the ocean fisheries. And it goes to show how important it is to get fish to survive into the ocean as well as it helps with escapement because they say we had 40 plus thousand fish return back to the feather this year, too. Right. right. Now going going back to this one just for a sec. Um, th this shows you that uh, if I'm reading this right, the um, Sacramento Fall seventy eight percent that's of hatchery origin. 
Yeah, so this is hatchery contribution slide. So it's not, it doesn't show you the natural contribution in this. Right. This is only of the hatchery fish, 78% of them came from the Sacramento complexes, whereas the McCallamy was only 18% and 15% comparatively. Which is actually pretty impressive considering it's one little small hatchery compared to three others. But it just right. it just goes to show you um, that reducing hatchery plants just doesn't make any sense in this state. You know what I mean? I mean, if, if the hatcheries are contributing that, I mean, that the feather, going back to your uh, this slide here, and it takes me a while to process charts, but 50% of the recreational ocean salmon fishery was produced by feather river is that is that how I'm, am i reading that right yeah uh, yeah so out of all of the hatchery fish that were caught in the ocean one out of two of those fish were from the feather river yeah okay so uh it just it just goes to show that um again california has well let's go central valley let's yeah um central valley is a unique situation that we have no habitat left. The dams are blocking everything. Water issues, on and on and on. Why are we reducing hatchery fish numbers? Yeah. It's the only thing that's keeping all of us uh, in the rivers fishing, all the ocean businesses alive, all the ocean recreation. And without any of that, uh, nobody has a fishery. Yeah, you take away. I, I I said if you take away the hatcheries, it's they're gone. Uh, you and if you take away even you know trucking, which the state doesn't even agree with trucking fish because the stray rates are higher, and they say in their own documents in HSRG, which says that we need to kill unspawned salmon, right? Yeah. In the same document it says don't truck fish it's bad for the system yet we truck fish because it's the only way we can have survival in our challenged system i will say yeah i mean there the system is artificial it's completely right. It's right. Like if you just humans just decided to build a river out of nowhere i mean that's kind of where we're at and so there's nothing natural about these systems anymore i mean there's a few you know battle creek and butte creek and beer and some of those creeks on the sack are still somewhat intact but they still have issues too but generally speaking everything's thrashed i mean it's just completely human altered these are like ditches basically and without hatcheries we got we got this much right right so, anyway all right um and that's gonna lead, and that's gonna lead into the reintroduction jd uh you know the, eventually just like on the klamath you know they're talking about starting to remove dams in 2023 now yeah. um and when they start removing dams they're reducing hatchery production on the iron gate from six million moving it to fall creek and going to 2.6 million on the klamath and then they're saying but that 2.6 million is going to all of a sudden repopulate hundreds of miles of new unopened habitat. I mean, you know, we, we've got to be realistic about it, but I mean, the Klamath is a different animal. And so if we want to talk or if somebody has questions about the Klamath, we'll answer them to the best of our ability, but mm -hmm. there are completely different uh, stressors on the Klamath, which we don't have on the central Valley. And we want to be clear that some of the things we're stressing on today's conversation are mainly the central Valley and the Sacramento complex. Sure. Sure. Um, we got, uh, well, let's get through just kind of your uh, general spiel on what's going on. And then we got a bunch of comments stacking up. So, yeah. Um, so what else, what, what's the latest? Give us the. Yeah. So uh, you know, the, the four, the four of us, and I'd say five of us, cause we have an alternate on the commercial troll, but uh, John Keppen and George Bradshaw representing uh, California troll have been doing a phenomenal job representing their industry. Uh, John Atkinson from New Rand sport fishing has been doing a good job representing his industry of charter boats. Uh, Jimmy Yarnell and myself represent all of the recreational sport anglers that fish in the ocean um, and visit uh, the oceans in all ports, all the way down from the Mexico border, all the way to uh, the Oregon border. And um, so when we represent to try to come together with the five of us that uh, we, we are working on trying to shape your seasons and to move fish around and trying to adjust the model um, and, you know, being able to allow people to see 
uh, some of the things that we do when it comes to um, adjusting the seasons and how it works. It's not just walk into a room and, you know, two guys ask for this and two ask for that. Yeah, Rochambeau and and we call it good. It, it literally is a long process. It's one of the hardest things for me to understand as a private citizen and a private business owner. Um, you would be fired if you operated <laughs> your private business in these manners because it it uh, I'm used to. Uh, here's the problem. Here's the solution. Let's and it. let's go. And I'm on to the next thing. Uh, however, in this type of um we'll say management according to the fnp and everything it's a, it's a challenge and it's a process and we have to go through this process and, and some people don't understand it so i encourage people to understand to, to uh you know attend and kind of see what happens you know i i, I uh, if you're new to the process i encourage you just to listen a lot and a lot of your answers will be will be uh, answered. But uh, it is a it is a challenge. I was going to try to pull up the SAS room number. You need to download the app of uh, Ring Central. And uh, after you download that app of, on Ring Central, you can then um, join specific rooms according to uh, the council process. And so you can go to the council floor and listen to all of the states uh, debate and and um and approve and adopt uh, motions towards certain fisheries, ground fish, halibut, salmon, uh, or you can go into the smaller rooms, uh, which I'm a member of is the SAS, which is the Salmon Advisory Sub Panel. And so that's what I just mentioned. And I believe that room number is um, on the Ring Central app. I'm trying to pull it up for you guys. I apologize for not having it uh, readily accessible. Um, but you, you would uh, attend the meeting and the way that you do that is you go to meeting ID 149-883-1597. Again, that's meeting ID 149-883-1597. And you just download the Ring Central app or on your computer and then you hit that meeting ID and it's a public meeting. So you can enter that room on Monday. Mm -hmm. And we will be in there with the other members of Washington, Oregon, Idaho and a conservation rep. And then we deliberate, you know, Southern resident killer whale impacts, impacts that affect the whole coast, uh, the commercial fleet, uh, recreational anglers in the ocean and how that all works. But part of our task as individual state um, representatives that are appointed uh, we take that um, information and we we input it into the model to try to set the seasons. And so I can tell you like the most current alternatives as of right now mm -hmm. uh, that, we're, that we're looking at, which this is a fluid document, right? These can change at any moment. So, um, you know, we're working with stakeholders telling us we want to see what this cost us in the model. We want to see what that cost us in the model. So this round we're kind of doing a little variable to kind of see what it's going to cost and doing some differences on some things mm -hmm. and i'll explain all of that but the normal california ocean season goes from april the first saturday in april and it goes until the end of august that is your normal salmon season right. in the ocean it goes april to august and then any fishing after August, that's called fall fisheries, or we call them credit card fisheries. Mm -hmm. And that's where any fish that we catch in the ocean in the months of September, October, and November, those basically count against us the following year as a credit card does. So you're basically taking next year's fish or intercepting still fish that are coming in and we've had these fall fisheries for a number of years to keep the fleets alive right. because it's been so dismal for the last 14, 15 years. Yeah. And so we've got accustomed to these fall fisheries and there are times to have them, I think. And I think that there's times to not have them. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's another topic that's being debated now. Our first round of alternatives went through November this round of alternatives uh, end at the end of October. So there still is two months of fall fisheries. Um, and then the, another alternative that ends on October 17th in this round. So a couple of weeks cut out of the fall fishery. Uh, but we're looking at, you know, uh, you know, dates starting sometime in May now. 
um, on our start dates. Um, I don't want to really give um, tons of specific dates right now because they're going to change by tomorrow. And I don't want you all to go out and say, oh, James said this. And that's what the ocean fishery is because uh, it's a fluid document. It's changing. Um, we're trying to find ways in this new model to give you the most opportunity. And, you know, it's funny, we, you know, working with the model, myself and uh, another individual on the SAS that works hard uh, for the commercial fleet, George uh, Bradshaw, we're the two representatives that were given the model from the state and NOAA fisheries. And so we're allowed to operate it on our computers and we screen share with the public in that California SAS breakout meeting. So if you really want to learn how it works, I encourage you just to join for a couple hours and see it because it's just going to blow your mind. It's just, it's amazing, the process. But do you have a uh, real quick, I'll put a banner up if you got that meeting ID number. Yeah, sure. Um, so the meeting ID is you're going to go to Ring Central. You're gonna, that's the app, you know, like a Zoom it's Ring Central, R I N G Central. Got it. And the Salmon Advisory Sub Panel, S A S, Salmon Advisory Sub Panel, meeting ID is 149 49 883 883 1597. Okay. Yeah. And there's a whole other, you know, list of, you know, meetings that you can attend. I know you probably can't see that, but that's just one. I posted that on the NorCal page for anyone that's an ocean fisherman, that's a member of ours. And we've got a lot of ocean fishermen that are members of our group. Yeah. And, um, and uh, they all are very interested in what's going on with those with those other committees, you know, ground fish, halibut and all those things. So I encourage you to go. I'm focused on salmon and I don't really have any other time for anything else. But, um, yeah, that that meeting ID one four nine eight eight three one five nine seven. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that starts Monday again. And I encourage you to come see the process and, and have your voice heard. You can raise your hand and make comments. Um, Keep in mind. The public forum then, yeah. Yeah, this is part of your process, right? And so I want you to keep in mind that this is ocean fisheries only, so don't join and start blabbing about things that we can't control. Um, all we can do is control the ocean fisheries, regulations and dates and zones and size limits and look at those types of things for you on the ocean fisheries. If you want to have a talk about habitat or hatcheries or anything else, you know, inland or rivers or inland regs, a lot of that stuff happens after this fact. This is all ocean stuff right now. So we're working on the ocean. But, you know, the main it directly thing is, affects the river. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. So I guess I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll pivot from there and say that, you know, the abundance was low this year, 270,000 in the sack. And uh, on the Klamath, um, you know, uh, under uh, under two hundred thousand three and four year olds. Let's see, is that um, this chart? Let's see. Yeah, that's escapement there. Oh, yeah. That was last year, and so yeah, keeping that up, JD. I mean, that shows you how that red line is the minimum threshold. That's managing to the minimum. So since uh, you know two thousand seven, we've really came accustomed to just we've got to have just one hundred and twenty two thousand fish back since the first collapse. And you can see what managing to the minimum does. The only time you're going to go above that 122 in any substantial claim, which helps repopulate, reintroduce fish back to Deer Creek, Mill Creek, Battle Creek, Clear Creek, and gets more fish into those creeks and tributaries of the Sacramento is raising more hatchery fish and having better survival rate in the ocean and getting more fish back. Uh, when you start looking at that chart, Guys are going to say, oh, I remember 12 and 13 in the river. That was a better season. Yeah. You know, we figure that that red line should probably raise up to about 200,000 and raise our standards. But look at what would happen if we did that. If we raised it to 200,000 as being an acceptable escapement, if the fish had, you know, suitable habitat. And we've heard from top scientists and biologists, just the upper Sacramento alone, they said, is capable of 180,000 natural spawners. And I want to say they even said female natural spawners, which would mean, you know, three, wow. four hundred thousand fish can easily utilize the habitat that we currently have. 
um, which is just eye opening. When you hear those types of numbers from our top biologists, not to mention any names, but you hear that from them. And then when they turn around on the other side and say, yeah, but we can't raise any more hatchery fish because hatchery fish are bad. They uh, dumb down our stock and they hurt this wild Chinook salmon that we have. We're living in a fantasy if we believe that we have wild Chinook in the Sacramento Basin right now. I mean, hear this sound right here? This is me punching myself in the side of the head. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, listening to that. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. You know, you really got to look at that chart, though, JD, and people need to understand when you look at that chart. How do we find it acceptable to only let 122,000 come back? Look at one, two, three, four, some of our best numbers, our best records. Everything was thriving. American, Feather, SAC. And all of these areas were producing twice as many fish. Uh, Feather was producing uh, three times as many spring run. Um, <laughs> three times as many spring run in the Feather River. Up to five million back then. Now we're lucky to get a million um, and uh, it's a conservation hatchery now. We got to protect the endangered, the threatened. It's not even endangered yet. It's just a threatened Feather River hatchery fish. So we're protecting a Feather River hatchery fish threatened that's ruined tons of lives, tons of businesses, tons of recreational opportunity. Not to mention the publicly trusted resource, the failure to protect that resource for our kids and grandkids. And all we gotta do is raise more Feather River fish, give them better release sites, and then there'll be more of them in the ocean. There'll be more of them to come back and everyone wins. The it's a ocean win-win. Yeah, it's a total win-win. Win. Just raise more fish at this point. We, we are not, um, you know, uh, against natural spawning fish. We've encouraged it. We've been advocating for natural spawners since our inception in 1992. Right. Uh, we, we've been advocating not to dewater the reds for one. And then the biggest thing we've been advocating for lately is stop killing our fish unspawned in the hatcheries, shut the door and let them spawn naturally. Give them a chance to spawn. I mean, hashtag let them spawn. And we can't seem to get that through our heads that that's what we need to do. And so in other words, we've failed. We failed the people. We have failed the public trusted resource to produce more fish for you all. And it's sad. And, uh, you know, that's how gov big government conquers people is they divide us all. And when they divide us all, they get us into our individual groups. They get, uh, you know, uh, not to point out any groups, but uh, let's just say trout fishermen, bass fishermen, salmon fishermen, and uh, surgeon fishermen. And they all go in their separate ways. They can control you as a small group, but they can't control you as a mass. Right. And the problem is, is that we don't believe in attacking any of our fellow brethren or sisters in, uh, in our industries. And we don't, we don't believe in, uh, you know, uh, in any of that type of stigma, even though some people want to paint a broad brush over the top of me and say that I'm against ocean fisheries, that's further from the truth. And uh, if you question my integrity or you question my motives uh, towards ocean fisheries, I encourage you to reach out to other ocean fishery SAS representatives and ask them the truth. And they'll tell you that I'm there fighting for all of us. I'm for fighting for my kids, as I said in the last video. I'm, that's what I'm fighting for. I, I, I just, uh, you know, anyone that believes we're doing this for ourselves is, uh, you know, not is missing the point. But uh, right. with that being said, we've we've got many challenges facing us as an SAS, and we got many challenges this year in the ocean. As abundance is low. We're going to um, have very big challenges on both fleets, the commercial and the recreational ocean sport fleet. And it's going to be a minimum escapement this year, again, in the river of 122. They're going to follow the fisheries management plan and no fisheries guidance letter is to manage to 122,000 minimum. Um, okay, so let's let's give people a little uh, info on this process. So after you get done with this BFMC conference call you know, meeting uh, that you're doing for the next several days, what happens next? As I Excuse me. get you when you're drinking. <laughs> Sparkling ice, everyone. These are the new uh, new thing. <laughs> you, are you drinking a white claw right there? Or what? No, it's uh, sparkling ice water, zero sugar with caffeine. <laughs> uh, <love> you. <laughs> so, okay, so you get done with this meeting. 
And then nothing happens. I mean, you guys set up what three uh, alternative. Yeah, alternative uh, for the ocean season. And there's going to be some public uh, comment at some point, correct? That's correct. There'll be a there'll be a huge opportunity for everyone to get with the ocean uh, staff from CDFW and the SAS. It'll be virtual this year again. Um, it's normally held out on the coast, up and down the coast. But uh, that I think that's March 23rd or 24th, right around in there. And uh, forgive me for not having that date down, Pat, but that will be your last point to comment on the three alternatives and which ones you want to see. Um, and that's why I don't really want to tell you what the alternatives. I mean, I can it's a public process. So, I mean, I can tell you right now we're looking at Fort Bragg trying to open in in uh, June right now. Uh, uh, excuse me. KMZ opening up in June and Klamath Management, Management Zone and ending in July. We're trying to open up Fort Bragg in San Francisco in May right now and close it in October. And then we're trying to open up Monterey in April and close it in August or September right now. And that's what we're kind of looking at. However, like I said, these are all, uh -oh. we lost all going to change. Included okay. was a 20 size limit ocean wide for everyone no 20 inch fish this year which is a big favorite of the charter boat industry and a big favorite of a lot of people who say that hook and mortality of uh, catching you know trying to weed through 2021 20, 22 23 mm -hmm. inch fish can have a, a, a larger effect than uh and just harvesting yeah. those fish uh, um, yeah throwing them back over the rail a lot and so um that's the big argument for a 20 inch fish versus a 24 inch fish um and i've i heard a lot of comments from our last talk about that people are not happy to hear about 20 inch fish but it's been around for a long time sure sure, sure. okay so then um after that um who, what's the season setting schedule after that point after the public comment public period meeting. Yeah, and, and that and you can you can submit public comment all the way till that next meeting. Uh, you can submit it now live on the PFMC this whole week until Thursday. By Thursday, we'll have those three alternatives. Yeah, you can come to this meeting and have comment and, you know, and be members of the public. And then you can shape the season with us until Thursday. By Thursday, we leave with the three alternatives. Then those go to you guys back again to public comment. And then it comes back to us in April, including public comment. And then from there, we choose one of the three and then that becomes the season. Okay. So that's how that works. But we're under some major constraints on the Klamath this year again, just like last year, which is causing all sorts of problems when you model the seasons. Right. And the ocean harvest model was changed this year. Um, no fisheries in CDFW felt that it was imperative that the amount of effort, specifically in the San Francisco sector, was so great over the past few years that the amount of fish were actually over harvested according to the model. So uh, the model is predicting we're going to harvest, you know, 50,000 fish, for example, and we're harvesting 80,000 fish or, you know, that's just an example. That's not actual numbers. Right. Uh, but, you know, the model says we're going to harvest 500,000 fish. We're harvesting way over that. The model says we're going to harvest a thousand. We're harvesting over that. We're not har under harvesting according to the model. So yeah. no fisheries and CDFW this year decided to change that model, which has put even greater constraints on ocean fisheries um, and it's hurt ocean fisheries. Yeah. To give you an idea of how much change that has gone on in the model setting uh, we inputted last year's seasons just to be comparative, uh, which they say we got 137,000 back um, and uh, it would only allow about 93,000 fish back into the rivers this year, which that's when I started using our logic from knowing what we know. And I started saying, wait a second. So I asked a question in another meeting and I said, uh, Dr. O'Farrell, um, does this mean that the model could be off from the past, right? Um, if we were over harvesting, you know, that means that we are right in the in the river. The fish aren't there. They're not right. coming back. Right. And, uh, you know, but we keep getting these numbers to meet escapement. And it's uh, it's an interesting topic. All I'll say is it's very interesting on the Feather River. We get in these high numbers uh, that are reported by DWR, who does the counting. 
um, who's in control of the water. And then they tell CDFW how many fish came back and we just nod our heads and move along. I, I, uh, we, we argue the last few years that the numbers have been extrapolated and manipulated and uh, it's uh, it's unfortunate. There's no concrete proof because nobody can go count every fish. Right. And, uh, you know, when you get one of those guys that's honest with you in the parking lot or calls you off the record and tells you, man, we're throwing darts at a dartboard. And, and that's the that's the lingo that's that, that these fisheries, some, some of these fishery biologists, I don't want to say all because, uh, you know, uh, but but in, in all reality, if we're being honest and we're being truthful, uh, the mark recapture method is effective in certain ways and aspects, but it's also um, it hurts anglers, too, because it manipulates how many fish are really there. And then they use that number to say, oh, well, you harvested around 15 percent of what came back. And then they say that we like last year, we, they say we killed 16000 fish when most guides never even went over a hundred fish for the entire season, which right. is normally a, a given for any guide that's yeah. going to work 50 plus days. Right. So anyway, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a reel me back in, but. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, that, that leads us to our next one, which is um, river seasons. I'm sure a bunch of people on here are wondering what the process for setting the river season is. Yeah. So when, when that happens later in the spring, I know that. But um, go ahead and give a little little background on how that process works. Yeah, so after we get through the PFMC process in April and we choose one of the alternatives for the ocean for commercial and rec and then everything's set, um, they might already be fishing actually because fisheries are always set a year in advance. Um, so uh, the fishery is going to probably open in Monterey this year on April 3rd. Monterey is looking the best. If you're from Monterey, get your boats ready. I think you're going to be fishing the entire season and uh you know lord willing you you deserve it because of all of your winter run impacts you guys have had over the past you know five years uh we finally gave you a season last year and uh we're so happy that it looks everything is pointing to a really good season for recreational fishing in the monterey sector this year because we don't have major winter run impacts it's all Klamath and that's based to San Francisco, Fort Bragg sector and up. To give you an example, we think we're gonna have around 1200 impacts on Klamath four-year-olds in the uh, ocean this year for the recreational sector at the, at the worst. And uh, you know, Monterey sector is 12 impacts for the entire season. So uh, it looks like you guys are gonna get a full season in Monterey. Um, but once we come back and we set all of the seasons for the ocean and it's completed at the end of the council process, which is around April 12th this year, I believe right around that week when that closes out, then we will have uh, discussions with the Fish and Game Commission and the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, CDFW, and we will start discussing inland management. Now, with the standard 122 escapement, the department's going to say it's a standard fishery. We're going to follow the FMP and it's probably going to be a two fish limit inland uh, on the river. I think that a lot of us are leaning towards a one fish uh, rule this year because of uh, the change in the ocean harvest model in the ocean, um, the uncertainty of uh, what we believe happened last year and how the model was off by over 150,000 fish. Um, and uh, if the model's off this year, then we're in trouble for next year. So. Yeah, we might need we might want to take a little pain this year in order to, um, you know, protect our future, um, you know, and that's something that uh, the ocean fisheries still need to discuss also. And, you know, their aspects and, you know, I'm part of that talk, too, with my PFMC hat on. And when I have that hat on, we have to talk about fall fisheries and fishing in September and October and how much of an effect that has. You know, we started talking about run timing and how our runs are getting later and later. And you're seeing your American River run get later and later every year. So, Absolutely. you know, are we impacting? Are we running into more of those spawning fish when they're trying to come into the gate? Are we interrupting, you know, some of that timing? And is that hurting us? You know, I mean, I get it on both aspects. I mean, from the ocean looking out inward inland, if you're looking inland, you're saying, well, why would we want more fish to go back when they're just going to kill them on spawn and they don't have the best habitat and everything else. And so I get, I get your argument 100% at the same time, you know, for the inland fishery, the recreational fishery and to ensure escapement of over 122, 
we always want to advocate to make sure that we're getting that 122 at a very minimum because otherwise it puts everyone in uh, in worse fishing conditions. All right, you ready for some uh, yeah, let's comments? Do let's yeah, do it. Change. We'll do another update uh, like midweek or something, and we'll get everyone you know kind of where we are with specific dates on the ocean and uh, and uh, catch everyone up at the end of this week. All right, we're gonna try to get to everybody here. Let's see. Sounds good. Mike Patton's listening from Lake Almanor. What's up, Mike? See you on Pyramid soon. Rand George, great job. Um, Bradley Miller, need lots more hatchery fish. By the way, thanks, Rand. I'm just going through these. Uh, yes, yes, Bradley. Yes. How come we all can see it? <laughs> but the, the yeah. we can't. Um, Brad, let me get back to Brad. He messaged us on the thing. So, yeah, I kind of told you those dates. So, yeah, we're looking at like May dates if you're San Francisco and uh, and Fort Bragg right now starting. I think uh, I don't want to say it's going to go into June, but, you know, it, it, it very well could. It, it, it's ugly this year. Uh, and if you fish out of San Francisco and Fort Bragg, you might be delayed until June, depending on what happens everywhere else. Um, it, it, it could open in May, though, very, very well. Um, April fisheries are, are starting to look dismal at this point, except yeah. in the Monterey sector. Thanks, Brad. Southern fish, yeah. Uh, oh, thanks, Pete. We're, Thank you, we're Pete. doing what we can. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt McCullough says there's a herring spawn. Oh, he's in Suquamish up in Washington. He's playing a little uh, Grateful Dead in the background. <laughs> it's like he's having a nice time. So, uh, there used, there's a bay right there in Suquamish that used to have gigantic, I mean, they had all kinds of stuff in Town, but I guess, uh, Matt, you can probably confirm this, ginormous Pacific cod in there, too. Anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, who doesn't believe in why? I assume you're talking, Sam, about the... Uh, the need the for and, mm -hmm. and and we've covered that a lot but it's it's the powers that be that think that hatchery fish are inferior and i think a lot of that and correct me if i'm wrong james but uh, comes from sort of an ivory tower phd biologist mentality that isn't really rooted in uh reality <laughs> it's you know it's this pie in the sky great idea but Anybody who can take a look at this, you know, the American River, for example, that has no no uh, tribs or anything on it and hardly any gravel, how is that going to happen? So, anyway, that's that's uh, you can probably explain yeah. all that, but yeah, I just say that the state of California, your CDFW employees, some of them, not all, but some, um, believe that hatchery fish are not the appropriate uh, knob to turn. Um, and uh, some believe that it is. And uh, until we have a uh, upper leadership position in Sacramento that believes that it is the correct knob to turn, uh, you're not going to see more hatchery fish in California unless there's a disaster and they feel bad and they raise them for us, which, you know, we just proved on the earlier part of this uh, live stream that uh, the contribution of us getting that 2 million extra fish uh, helped the ocean so much. I mean, it just changed the whole dynamic shift of the ocean. So if that's not proof in it enough that we need to raise more fish. And that was kind of our whole purpose of that in 2017 was to prove this to people that it's a put and take fishery. Cause we've been saying this for a long time. Uh, it just started getting traction and we had to use the Orville spillway crisis to write our narrative of, uh, of hatchery production, but it's obvious uh, they know it and uh, we know it. And it's just going to be a matter of time until we get the correct politician, governor, director, or chief of fisheries that is going to fight for hatchery production uh, to be a temporary band aid on the overall uh, salmonid issues. Right. Salman, I'm up there, Feather Riverway. I uh, imagine if Feather River, oh yeah, if Feather would run at 100% capacity, yeah, baby. Yeah, uh, thanks for all you did back in the past, Sal. I know that you fought hard yeah. back in the day, and uh, thank you for everything you've done. Uh, didn't go unnoticed. I just want you to know that. And uh, there's a lot of people that are out there that have fought over the years, and uh, it takes us all. It takes us all. That's what our organization's about, NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association, being about everyone having 
up, uh, you know, a stake in the game and everyone, you know, fighting together. And uh, that's why our organization's growing larger than most organizations right now, even through COVID. Right. right. Thank you. Thanks, Sal. Your- uh, let's see. JJ Brown. <sighs> he was, well, a commercial take. That's, I think that's, you misled oh. there because commercials don't have a, a yeah, limit. Yeah. JD, if I was to um, text you a picture from the Salmon Information Meeting, would you be able to post it? Um, email it to me because my phone is also my webcam. <laughs> okay, so I could do that. And then we could answer this question live. And I'm sorry for the people that got to wait for a couple of seconds here, but I'm going to... Um, I'm going to send that to you, JD. It's got no uh, subject line. It's just one picture, but that that will answer uh, catch an effort. Um, I've got the, I've also got the, um, the pounds and average weights if you want uh, per vessel, but there was a, um, let's see, total, total pounds landed and other vessels. uh, Yeah. So that's another important one. I mean, there's a bunch of them that we could, post up for you guys, which are all part of the salmon information meeting. Um, and I'll send two of them to JD right now so that he can post these two. Um, but, uh, what's important to know is that, uh, last year, I believe commercial vessels that actually had a permit, it was, uh, 1032 vessels actually paid for a commercial salmon trolling permit. And I believe uh, 472 participated in the fishery last year. So less than half, right? Because half would be 516. So 472 actually turned in at least one salmon. And uh, 64 of those vessels turned in 50% of the landings. So there are 64 commercial fishermen out there they catch half the fish. Um, And then the other 50% of the fish that are caught are caught by the other 400 and so boats. Um, So it goes to show you that there are um, a lot of fishermen and women that are running commercial operations. Um, There's the commercial catch. Yep. So that's one of them, commercial catch and effort. So you can see this one right here. And so this uh, this shows you uh, the amount of days from 2011 to 2020. And the catch is how many fish are caught and how much effort is on the other side. And effort is measured in days fish times a thousand. Um, So that's how you get the amount of catch for effort. And then there's going to be another slide that JD will pop up and that will show how many pounds were caught by the commercial uh, industry as a, as a total. But the industry has gone way downhill on the commercial industry also, you know, their abundance numbers were through the roof. Uh, We had, you know, million plus abundance in the ocean. And now we're lucky to see, you know, 300, 400,000. Um, Here's the other slide for commercial uh, vessel value and price per pound. Um, So you can see that chart as well as how the price per pound dictates things. So, you know, on the commercial fleet, I'm not a commercial fisherman, but I am a businessman. So I understand supply and demand. It's pretty simple. Um, Obviously, if if all the boats are catching tons of salmon, then your price is going to go down unless there's huge demand. And if the demand isn't there, such as holiday occasions, such as Mother's Day and Father's Day and 4th of July and Labor Day and Memorial Day and other events to where salmon fishermen want to get out there and catch salmon so that it can go to the market to feed your families, um, you know, they they have to go during those certain timelines. And so cutting into their season is is just it's just heartbreaking because it it destroys the entire industry and that's what i think people don't understand how how we all work together uh on a salmon uh, salmon fisheries management in order to make sure that you know people are getting fed because there's a lot of people that are unfortunately not capable of going out and catching their own salmon and so they have to rely on the commercial fleet to go do their job 
and to produce salmon so that you can go to Whole Foods, Safeway, Albertsons, you know, Food Max, wherever, Costco, Sam's Club and Walmart and go get your salmon. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, that's uh, all that. Sorry to be long winded on that, but that's all right. Thanks, JJ Brown. Uh, you got you got your money's worth on that one. <laughs> uh, Carson, who happens to be live on the sack, if I recall, um, watching. Uh, what is the reason that they're cutting our hatchery harvest? Um, re- yeah. Wow. Well, I, I assume he's talking. Well, what do you? I think he's uh, talking about our hatchery. He's saying reduce our hatchery, uh, meaning like reduce our hatchery fish. I think is what he's yeah, saying. I, I don't think harvest is the right right word. That threw me off a little bit, but um, well, then, you know, it gets back to all that hatchery fish are inferior, allegedly. Yeah, maybe post up on uh, if you want to type something on the screen right now. Type up uh, HTTP um ca hatchery review.com and that's what everyone needs to read um you know that's was pointed out to me a few years ago but um ca hatchery review.com and if you go to that yeah ca hatchery review.com that's going to give you the basis of hsrg hatchery science review group you know and uh in many ways i mean you know they're telling the truth in the system but these weren't uh, these were a group of scientists and biologists that basically reviewed themselves and uh, got into a room and said, okay, what are we doing good? What are we doing bad? How can we do better? And they started writing reports based on their own current operations and reviewing themselves. And to me, it makes no sense um, because I would want an independent review of any government agency that's trying to review themselves to make them work better um, for the people because it's a public agency and you work for the people. So uh, anyhow, but uh, with that being said, HSRG, read that document, uh, Kaysen, and uh, we'll have more conversation and uh, you'll understand why they don't like hatchery fish. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, Rocky Road says we need a hatchery on the Yuba. I've been saying that for years. Uh, yeah, nice cold water up there probably won't happen, but who knows? Very true, Rocky. And uh, yeah, the I think our best bet on the Yuba is since we've had so many strays coming off of the Feather River hatchery, I think our best chance is to advocate for reintroduction with Feather River fish and uh, and then see if we can get them to naturally spawn and start returning to the Yuba once more and start to repopulate in that area. But it's not going to, there, there are no wild fish left. So the only way to do that is with hatchery fish. You're absolutely right there, Brad. It's, it's not just revenue, it's recreation, it's protein, it's, it's stuff for humans to do. It's, it's rotting carcasses in the river to sense, yeah. supply the, uh, the river, you know, lifeblood. Um, uh, what over all percent of uh, the harvest ocean is commercial versus rec? Oh, that's a good question. And do you yeah. know those numbers? I'm sure you do. Uh, I've got it. Um, yeah. Um, I will say there's a historical split. And so we, uh, that's something we're working on now as we always talk about that. However, I want you to be cautious on when I say historical split, but you know, the split sometimes ranges, but it's somewhere around 70, 30, 75, 25 most of the time. So the way that we work it out is uh, we have either Klamath impacts that we have to watch out for, which is what we have to watch out for this year. And we have a certain amount of impacts, right? Let's just say for making numbers easy, it's a thousand, right? You have a thousand impacts. It's a 75, 25 split. The commercial fishery gets 750 impacts. We get 250 impacts. And then so you shape your season and you can see in the model when you start looking at all of these charts and you can start looking at each individual chart and seeing what month uh, and what sector gives you the most impacts on the climate. If that's going to be the most uh, uh, if that's going to be the most constraining factor of setting the season, if it's not that, then it's the sack abundance. And if it's sack abundance, which it isn't this year, but if it was the sack abundance, that's when Monterey fisheries get into effect and San Francisco, more San Francisco and Fort Bragg. And sometimes the KMZ, because our uh, sack fish used to go up to Coos Bay and then they'd circle back down through the Oregon coast. So this affects ocean fisheries too. So that's what a lot of people don't understand is that there's a split for Sacramento fish between Oregon and us first. 
So, um, and that split historically can be anywhere 70, 30, 80, 20 um, in those realms too. And so if there's a hundred thousand sackfish, right off the bat, 20,000 to 30,000 of them are gone, then they're gonna be allocated to Oregon for their models, for their people. And uh, so we've always got to worry about that as well and how much our system affects everyone. And so that's why when people say, oh, we're not worried about just you inland guys, it only affects Yuba City and uh, Chico and Redding and Red Bluff and Sacramento. Big deal. It doesn't. It, this, affects, this affects every port from Coos Bay all the way down to Morro Bay, almost to the U.S.-Mexico uh, border fishery. This affects almost the entire West Coast. And I would even argue and advocate that if you don't restore this fishery, all you're doing is what JD and Bob and we always talk about is effort shift. All you're doing is shifting the effort onto other stocks. And then we start pounding the rogue stock. And then we start pounding the Columbia stocks. And then we start pounding the other stocks because everyone's trying to pay bills and everyone's trying to survive. And, you know, so, so people aren't dumb. They're going to move to where fish are. And so if they are a troller, that fishes out of Crescent City and Fort Bragg and they can't make any money here because we don't raise enough fish. Well, then if they have an Oregon permit, they're going to go into Oregon and they're going to try to catch fish there to feed their families. And I can't blame them. Yep, absolutely. All right. Uh, 2014 was the last best salmon steelhead year we've had on the American River. Less water, warm weather. Yeah, I would uh, I would say that wasn't a great year compared to uh, going back to 2002. Well, um yeah it's it's been a while it's been a while and you're right um warm water no water all that that good stuff uh you're welcome bob we we're trying um Kirsty. farmers and fishermen have a lot more in common than the troublemakers in the media who relentlessly try to pit them against one another like we'd like you to know besides both industries being multi-generational and family owned both are targets of posers who use environmental environment as a weapon to destroy free market business. Divisive tactics are just as clever distraction to the two. Yeah. 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 You're right. That's a really good point. Christy. Hello. I hope you're doing well. We've never met in person. Christy runs the California movement for water page and advocates for. Whoops. Sorry. That's okay. Christy advocates for water for a lot of her people down there in Southern California. And, um, you know, um, yeah, Christy, there's a lot of common things that happen uh, to fishermen and farmers and people want it to portray. And uh, I'll say just like uh, everything else in our world currently, um, the media is biased in many different uh, ways on many different sides. And uh uh, we want to work what's we want to work with the people that are trying to find a solution to the problem. And we believe that there are people that are out there that can help us get to that solution. We need to raise more fish and we need to get more fish out there. And that will solve all the problems and would probably alleviate a lot of people complaining about more water going down to Southern California if there's still a fishery. I think that yeah. the argument is a lot of times they put fishermen against farmers, as you know, and uh I don't need to mention any names or groups or anything else, but, um, you know, the, it, it's a challenge and uh, we're, we're dying. Uh, we're literally on our deathbed. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we don't know how much longer we're going to be able to even continue working. Um, you know, we're, we're at that point and there'll be some naysayers that will say that they're working and doing just fine, but most of them have a pension or have uh, something that is, uh, allowing them to, uh, fish like that. Uh, but as a full-time, uh, sole income, uh, as a fisherman anymore inland, uh, it, it's going away. I'm going to lose three of my board members this year, uh, you know, um, and it's sad. Uh, we don't, we don't know how, how much worse it's going to get, but, uh, it's challenging times. And we look forward to talking to you and others about any ways that we can all work together to try to find a path forward to getting more fish in our system. Yeah. One of the, one of the things where farmers and fishermen really can get together is that, you know, the rice field salmon raising projects. I mean, there's a lot of that stuff that we could, uh, get together on. So, uh, thanks for that, Christy. Really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. Good points. Will Schwab, thank you for tuning in. Um, Mike Patton, live from Lake Almador. Almador? 
I got combined lakes there. Almanor. <laughs> Amador used to be an awesome fishery 20 years I, I ago. Think I think they're doing okay. Again. Are they good? Yeah. Um, amazing how many percent of fish harvest come. Yes, isn't it? I mean, that's a pretty stark uh, indictment of why we need uh, more hatchery fish. Okay, uh, JJ Brown's back. They consider having a tag system for fish harvest around SF. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, a punch card is what they have on the Klamath. So mm -hmm. um, uh, we have currently in the valley, there's no, you know, if, if going back to that, if you fish the Klamath, the Trinity, and the Smith for Chinook, you have to buy a North Coast salmon punch card and you have to punch up the salmon you get. And you have a, I don't know what the maximum is, but there's a, I think there's an annual limit on how many, or maybe you just have to buy a new card. I think you just got to buy a new card. Yeah, okay. So, um, that this is no way legal advice. <laughs> yeah. Check your local fishing game laws. Okay. Uh, Travis Small, do Klamath fish really go south off of Big and Gold Bay? Absolutely, they do. And, um, yeah, and I think that that's one of the – Travis, you had good questions last time too. That's a great question, um, and I think that it's more so than we ever thought. And so that's why this model change this year really shaping the ocean model because the amount of effort, the amount of people that fish in the San Francisco sector, it has had a significant impact on the Klamath Coastal Chinooks. Well, and it's it's uh, the, the whole and model so help felt, alleviate a little bit, I, I guess. So that's what's supposed to happen. But yes, they do. And uh, that timeline of impacts is more so in the May and June timeline. As you get later in the summer, those fish are moving back up the ocean to enter back into the Klamath system. So there's not as many impacts in July and August in the ocean as we have in that May and June timeline. But July is still an expensive month. They all can still be because those fish can dwell down there yeah lot feed steve says managed into extinction that could be the the uh, i mean that's basically that was a tagline to our movie on <laughs> spawn um yes yeah yeah man man managed into extinction for unspawned one and unspawned two is gonna probably be managing to the minimum it's like uh i, I just you know I mean, if I ever went out there with expectations in any job that I've ever had, and I've had a lot of jobs and I've succeeded at almost every job that I've tried to do, but if I ever tried to just do the minimum, I mean, you're, you're not going to go anywhere. I know, you don't get a raise. You don't keep your job. Um, I was hoping you're going to say unspawn to electric boogaloo, but <laughs> um, now Jeff Gonzalez is kind of a radical. He's a uh, longtime guy in the Valley, although I understand he just sold his business. Um, so that's, that's another thing. Here's another guide who has been uh, guiding since the eighties, probably in Sacramento Valley and yeah. uh, decided to sell his business and his boat. And I guess probably moving out of town. Um, he's got a radical idea, and I don't know if if I'll I'll, I'll post it and we'll see what we can think about it here. Um, before you, while you're reading that, I I just uh, <laughs> good good comment. I mean, you know, it's it's crazy talk, but <laughs> hey, we'll give you full credit. Let's just do it, okay? Yeah, yeah I don't care whose idea it was. Uh, what were you going to say before that? Before we I was just going to say, that's really sad news that we're losing Jeff. I mean, Jeff is an iconic guide on the river. He's one of my personal mentors. Uh, I got into the industry in salmon more so because of uh, Jeff and his, uh, you know, friends uh, that, uh, you know, helped, you know, uh, shape me and uh, as a fisherman in the river. And, uh, you know, I just... I want to say uh, thank you to him, uh, and uh, we're, we're we're sad to lose you, and uh, just be proud that you're out now before uh, many others, because there's going to be many others that follow. Uh, there's just the, the sustainability is not there anymore, brother, and uh, I'm sorry that uh, the government failed you, and uh, I'm sorry they failed your kids from ever uh, you know taking over your business, because your son could take over your business right now, and uh, he can't because the resource isn't there. So. Uh, I'm sorry, and uh, we're gonna miss you, and uh, we love you, and uh, good luck to you. Another uh, another sad day when another one of the guys who actually knows how to drive a boat uh, and pass you slowly on the outside of the hole uh, is leaving us. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, stay in touch, Jeff. 
that boat didn't turn sideways many much. <laughs> so, okay, Salvador, where do King Sam we catch every year while trolling stripers in the South Delta Ultimate come from? We caught two yesterday. Whether they're dark or silver, we put them back. Well, that's good because uh, South Delta is off uh, off limits. So you, if you caught two yesterday, those those off those have to be springers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's going to be springers that are going to be coming back. And if he's in the South Delta, my guess is going to be that those are going to be Feather River eggs that went to the San Joaquin hatchery to reintroduce the San Joaquin stripe or springers. Right. That the government says we cannot do interbasin transfers anymore. We cannot move eggs around. Oh sure that we have fish everywhere anymore but then when they want to do a program they do exactly that that, that the, the hypocrisy and that just baffles me oh that i know it's it's that and the fact that um we don't want hatchery fish because those might reseed the river oh but we're reseeding the river with uh, yeah. <laughs> <Again. We're> putting, <laughs> you know? yeah so there's probably san joaquin san joaquin spring run salmon you're catching down there uh hopefully they make it back yeah. uh but those were progeny of feather river eggs originally there's just some san your own feather king san feather king fish <laughs> yeah uh greg boys hey greg greg the sportsman, how can we force the hatcheries to produce more fish? Lawsuits? Yeah, that's potentially one. Are the hatcheries afraid of the WFC? Uh, well, fish can serve the center for biological diversity in those folks, the coops, in other words. Um, you also have a Native Fish Society and, and these people that are ruining fisheries all up and down Oregon, Washington. And you said yeah. the fishery managers. Managing to avoid lawsuits instead of trying to protect you, you you're more involved in that, but I would say uh, yeah. <laughs> you're aware of this too, because you fish and guide all of the West coast, but this is a problem we're facing in the whole West coast. Um, we have now had a few of these groups and you mentioned two of them, but we've had a, a lot of these groups that are suing on anything and everything they can do to get us off of the water and off of the lands. Um, and uh, the CBD was last was the Southern resident killer whales because their population is declining and they're ESA listed and they want reconsultation and they want to re to start building the population of Southern resident killer whales that travel from the Puget Sound down to Monterey Bay and they feed on Chinook salmon as 85% of their daily diet. And we've been dealing with that for the last two and a half years. And all we said was raise more California salmon and save the whales. It's a no brainer. Two of our stocks are listed as important stocks of the top 10 stocks for that, for those whales. So let's raise more fish and put them in the ocean so that they have them. I mean, it's a no brainer. And if they don't catch them all, well, then we might be able to catch a few extra. I mean, everyone, it's a win-win. The only people it's not a win for is elitists, as JD has said, and ivory towers sitting there that are threatening lawsuits over the top of the department, and the department is scared of those lawsuits, and so they will manage to the minimum to prevent more hatchery fish from being raised because they don't want them to stray and and to spawn in a, in a, in a non-natal stream that they were supposed to return. Oh, makes you crazy, doesn't it? It does. um, it's the truth. They, they, great uh, comment and question there, Greg. Appreciate it. And hope to see you, to see you out on the water one of these days. Um, G, oh, JJ Brown's coming back when he was in 40 fish, 50 fish people were catching was people on the river. Yeah. If you are, are harvesting 40 to 50 and putting them, I mean, really, how many salmon do you need? But that's a fair question. Um, okay. That is, and I want to say we did bring that up to the department. I want to say two and a half years ago, and it was just, uh, what if we were? Our question was: is if we went to a salmon punch card and NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association wrote legislation and introduced it to better salmon fishing for all, would you allow all of that money to go to the hatchery to raise more fish solely? Because if <laughs> right, right, if 
you promise that all the money goes to the hatchery and raise more fish. I think I could get all the fishermen on board to do a hatchery punch card and, and, and everyone's okay with that. Uh, if the money goes towards our resource, but we all know it's not going to go towards the resource. And so no one's going to get behind that. No one's going to support it. And it's hard as a member of that sits on the R3 program to recruit, retain and reactivate more fishermen and women in our state with our department I'm on the access and opportunity committee. And it's like, that's what I do is fight for you to have access and opportunity. So I don't want to take anything away, but uh, yeah, we need to raise more fish. We need it. We need, we need, we need to raise more fish now. There's not much time left. That's a fact. Uh, Travis, if the salmon go up the ladder are slaughtered and unspawned, why does the department not have to procure an incidental take permit? No. Well, wow. that's a great question. And the only answer, and I could be wrong. So I've been known to be off a little bit at times, but I'll tell you that uh, the uh, incidental take permit would only be a violation of a CESA listed fish or an ESA listed fish. And the only ESA listed fish in that ESU would be the Feather River Springer hatchery fish or they call them natural spawners if they're inside the river, but we all know that they're hatchery fish. And so in the Feather River, they do not need an incidental take permit if they are only killing fall run fish. And the thing that we discovered with our unspawn film is this has been going on for 20 years and they've been killing fish, whether they had an adipose fin or not. And for those of you that know in the Feather River, we only, uh, remove 25% of our fall run adipose fins. Only one out of four has no fin and a code wire tag in their head. So if we've been killing all these fish for all these years, you're telling me that we haven't been killing good natural spawning stock. Um, it's just, uh, it, it's uh, the logic is, is not there and it's failed. And I think that we have it proven through science. We have it proven. Go look at the numbers. I mean, look at the hatchery numbers and look at what they've done the last 15 years. Look how we've missed escapement year after year after year. Look how the survival rate is going down of smolts year after year after year. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. I mean, I think my six year old could figure it out, honestly, um, a little bit faster. You know, I mean, it's it's not that challenging to realize that this is a put and take fishery. I think that we just don't want to swallow that and we just don't want to admit that we failed. Um, but, you know, it, I don't even blame anyone. I mean, we, we put dams there for flood control, for water, for people, for water, for the entire state, you know, 60, 70 years ago. And we made that decision. And if we're going to live with the decision that the dams are going to stay in the Central Valley with no habitat and horrible water conditions, we have to mitigate for that. And we're not even arguing that we're not even fighting people over that. We're just saying mitigate for it. You, uns you, you, you dewater our fish to protect the winners, mitigate more fish. You, you don't have good water that year for natural spawners. Guess what? You're raising more fish next year. I mean, that's all the government is yep. supposed to do. You mitigate for your losses. And we just don't do that. Hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Absolutely. Scott says, if you discount the value of hatchery fish and therefore boy, thereby don't count them, then the agencies can exercise a lot more power over our rivers. That's a great, uh, that's question. True. and that's exactly what happens on the Klamath right now, and that's called an age-based modeling system, and that has already been proposed for the SAC um, moving forward to the council uh, through the ocean harvest manager, or ocean fisheries manager, and NOAA Fisheries. They believe that they can more accurately predict the SAC runs and the San Joaquin runs if they use age-based assessment, just like they do on the Klamath. Predict how many three-year-olds, how many four-year-olds, and how many five-year-olds are going to come back each year and manage according to that number rather than coming back to the hatchery numbers. We still have to look at all of that, but it seems that it would be more accurate for abundance and it would be more accurate for escapement purposes. We're a little concerned if it's going to affect our fisheries because if hatchery fish aren't counted towards the influence of making our mitigation goals, uh, we could be in trouble because we do have some pretty poor conditions at times, especially years like this when we're facing a drought. Uh-oh. Your uh, your Wi-Fi is getting funky. He's frozen. Is it? He's like this. 
my back. <laughs> yeah, you're you're all frozen up. So when you uh, when you come back to life, uh, we'll uh, we'll get you back. I'll I'll see if I can get uh, to some of these uh, questions while James is is waking up. Let's see. You there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. So Bradley Miller uh, wants to know if they're planning to do a net pin in Crescent City. I know they uh, – Dick Poole and GG, GGS, GSSA now. I get, always get that mixed up. Um, they've been talking about doing net pins in a lot of places. I don't I don't know that Crescent City is on the, on the radar yet, is it? Yeah, there actually is. It's on the radar. Um, I'm involved in a, some conversations that um, right now that pen program in, in Crescent City, and I encourage it. Uh, I don't know how far you guys are going to get with it. Um, we are supporting it as of right now. Um, we are behind the scenes and engaged in conversations. I think that it's a ways off um, from actually happening. But I think that uh, facing the challenges that you guys are going to face, especially with the main mitigation changes from iron gate to uh, fall Creek from 6 million to 2.6 million, you're going to face some challenges here once the dams get removed. So um, yeah. they are talking yeah. about it and there is discussion as well as in Humboldt Bay as well. Um, there's discussions on both. See my good place. To do it. Uh, thanks Bradley. Uh, Christy says, uh, oh. I'm in Central I'm Valley. Thank you. Um, I, I always say something going or something. What's that? You have speakerphone going or something? I'm getting an echo. No, I don't. Okay. Oh well. Carry on. Um, I was just gonna say hi, Christy. Sorry, I, I uh, we we call SoCal south of uh, Highway 80 in Sacramento. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I, I apologize. For saying SoCal. <laughs> Any from the North Coast says uh, we keep talking about getting CDFW to increase hatchery production. What's it going to take to make that happen? And the, the last part's probably the most pertinent part of the question. Is it even realistic? It's going to be a challenge, Kenny. It's going to be a challenge. Thanks for everything you do for us up on the North Coast. One of our leaders and advocates every year up there and uh, we appreciate you and everyone else up there in the North Coast that continues to fight hard. Um, you know, it's a challenge. I think that uh, can it happen? Sure. I think that, uh, you know, our voice alone is not going to be loud enough. Just us. I think we're going to need to partner with, uh, you know, hopefully some water users and uh, partner with some uh, different groups than we normally partner with in order to try to get it done. But uh, we have to we have to swallow the fact that uh, there are no wild fish left anymore. And once we swallow that fact and we stop managing a stock like they're wild and we just start managing it for what it is and then in the realistic california of 2021 uh that we have 40 plus million people we're we're facing uh, uh 50 million people in the next 10 years and we're gonna have uh, challenges water challenges population challenges infrastructure challenges it's gonna be all sorts of challenges in the state of california but if you want to have salmon and you want to make sure that salmon isn't affecting your industry, i.e. agricultural or population or um, or anything, we've got to raise more fish. It's the only solution uh, to getting that done at this point, short-term solution. There are some other long-term solutions, such as getting whoosh cannons and stuff over dams and, and you know, many other projects, but we don't need to talk about today. But uh, raising hatchery fish is the only thing I see that we can do now to the next five years. Oh boy, you're you're all uh, digitized again. Uh, let's see, your, your Wi-Fi might be funky or something. Do you want me to do that? Uh, I'd love to implement Robert. What's that? Yeah, he's to reconnect. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put him out for a second. I'd love to implement Robert uh, Robert Weiss idea of releasing more fish into the gravel bars from Redding to Red Bluff and restoring natural spawning salmon in the river, along with the release of a minimum of 3,000 carcasses on those same bed. Why is this not gaining more traction? Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that would be awesome. Let's see if we can get Stone back in here and see if he's heard anything on that. Uh, let's see. At this stream. Now we, he's gone. We lost him. 
So, um, well, hopefully we can get him back. I don't know what happened to Mr. Stone. It shows he's here, but now he's gone. Anyway, I'm not sure, Matthew, on that. Uh, uh, let's see. Here's James again. At him. Can you hear us? No. Ah, technology. Ain't it grand? And, and he's gone. Let me invite him again. Stand by just one second here, folks. Sorry for the uh, technological delay here, but... Uh, Stone lives out in the boonies, and his uh, his Wi-Fi uh, or cell signal or whatever he's on is no bueno. Okay. I invited him again. Let's see if he pops back up. But anyway, uh, there's the government's got to get behind it, and for some reason, they're not, not too into any of this kind of stuff, and I, I don't know why, man. It's just... It's sad because that, I mean, that used to, uh, we used to have something similar to that going on in the sack and uh, they used to release fry. Oh, here comes Stone again. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me there now? You go. So anyway, uh, Matthew, it, uh, they used to release fry up on the, the riffles on the sack and, and they discontinued that. And uh, did you see, were you able to read Matthew's comment? I'll pop it back. Uh, up. I'd love to implement Robert's ideas of releasing more fry on the gravel bars from Reading to Red Bluff, restoring natural bottom trying to um, Yeah, um, I think it's a great idea. We've been talking about this for years. Um, this isn't nothing new. Um, it's the same thing we've talked about for the last five, six years of suggestions to the department. But uh, your number one battle for that, Matthew, is uh, code wire tags. So uh, the fish have to grow up to at least 120 per pound in order to get a code wire tag. I think they can run through the system smaller, but they don't like them to. And in order to grow fish to that 120 per pound in order to get um, the 25% tag rate going, you uh, are running out of space. So the old days of until 1998, when we raised uh, 20 to 40 million fish at Coleman in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, it went all the way down to 1998 to where in 1999, we decided that we were only going to raise 12 million smolts because we started saying that uh, these fish uh, grow bigger. A bigger fish uh, has a better chance of going down the river. Uh, I think that there was a little politics played there. Um, and the honest thing is that when there were so many fry going down, especially the winter run fry, and they were getting sucked into agricultural and uh, municipal uh, pumps, uh, they were getting charged with uh endangered fish going into their pumps and so there was a huge push i think to um there was you know a lot of people screened their pumps and did a great job and everything they could do but at the same time there was a, a large challenge to uh get rid of the fry program because those little fish get sucked into pumps way too easy and uh if you go down to the tracy uh uh, federal pumps and the state pumps they do a count of how many fish get sucked into those pumps and it's by the millions and um if we raised bigger stronger fish they they were arguing maybe they could swim away from those pumps and uh yeah, the problem is is that when you put those fish in bigger you now just introduce the best size bait fish ever for stripers catfish bass maybe even sturgeon and many and many other uh, species, pike minnow. Um, all you all you did was just change the dynamic. Uh, salmon are supposed to swim out of the river this big. So uh, we agree uh, with the program. We, we, we're advocating for it and have since day one. Um, I brought it to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife's attention. We would like to see more fish raised in the raceways and released on the gravel beds reintroduction it's it's a standard plan it's nothing new it's not any new science it's just standard reintroduction it's how we would do it on the yuba it's how we would do it on all of the tribs up in deer creek mill creek and everything else um but uh, there's a lot of people that fear that uh if you put a uh, coleman hatchery fish there and for some chances there was a uh genetically pure wild strain fish in one of these creeks that you're going to just ruin the entire ecosystem which i think that we can all realize that it's already ruined <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay uh, well there you go matthew doyle's got a a, a good question here doyle, Miller. Hi, doyle 
What and when were the maximum valley hatcheries raised and how did they relate to escapement? So I've read books back on the Sacramento, um, not to jump in, J.D., sorry, but I've read books on the Sacramento that have gone back to the canning days when we had a commercial fishery on the river and we were we were harvesting in upwards of 60 plus million, upwards of 80 million eggs um, and back in those days. So when they say hatchery fish are bad now and we raise, you know, uh, you know, a total of 22 million in the valley, I just laugh because it's like we're not even, you know, raising a quarter of what one river used to. And, and that was before we even had dams. So um, yeah. Yeah. getting back into Coleman days, the actual numbers, if you go back to the Black Report, which was written in 1992 when the CVPIA was introduced, which was the Central Valley uh, Partners Agreement for um, water flows down the Sacramento River on the Federal Waterway, as well as the American River, managed both by Bureau of Reclamation. The 1992 report, we call it the Black Report. It was Michael Black who wrote it, and I believe it's on page 205 to 232 of that report. If you go back and you look in 1992, you'll see that Coleman used to raise 48 million eggs, and they would raise those 48 million eggs all the way up into fry, which on most given years, 24 to 32 million fry would be raised. And um, those numbers started dwindling as they got time. And there's actually, we've been told by a hatchery worker from Coleman that they were required to kill, even today, they, were, they are required to kill every Chinook salmon that is an egg eye form, we call it eyed, right before they emerge from the sack. If they meet their mitigation goal, give or take 15%, every other fish gets killed. <laughs> it's just baffling to me. Every year, millions of fish get killed on the hatcheries. And we don't even talk about that, you know. And um, and the department goes, why would you say that? It gives us a black eye and everything. But it's the truth. Oops. He went away again. Yeah, that's insane, though. Golly. Um, and, and going to some of his point was um, – I talked to a, a guy years ago who was a who worked for fish and wildlife well, was fishing game back then. And he told me he was sort of a self uh, pronounced Sacramento Valley fisheries historian. And uh, just, just for no other reason than his own curiosity. And I guess uh, it's been a long time since I think 20 odd years since I had this conversation with the guy, but he had said that um, they estimated that the annual Chinook run in the central Valley was somewhere in the, you know, a couple million. I mean, can you imagine, <laughs> you know, think about all the little creeks and I mean, just fish everywhere. I mean, I think back just to even like 2002, when we had a jillion fish, there were fish in every farmer's ditch, every gutter. I mean, they were everywhere. And so you can only imagine when all the streams are healthy, it was just insane. But the other thing he told me was there were, I think he said four, if I, if memory serves canneries on the river. I mean, that, I mean, this river's so well that for one shows you how many fish we used to have, but two, how altered everything is. I mean, canneries, I'm sure, wiped out the fish. Uh, and then, of course, you had um, hydraulic mining and all that other stuff that did the river in. And then we've had hatcheries for over 100 years. So trying to get back to this whole thing about wild fish just makes no sense. Let's see if uh, we got our man back here. His service is uh, a little funky. You there? I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay. For, for now. Okay, let's uh, do a lightning round here so we don't have to keep everybody for hours. Um, um, uh, John, Bar oh, this is my personal favorite uh, comment of the day. Let's just leave that up there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, the man, the fishing who, who buddy, legendary, uh, legendary guy to the nineties. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh, now I'm frozen because my phone's ringing. Ah, oh, hang on. We still there? There we go. My yeah, phone rang. I got you. Everything went funky. Um, let's see. Can I love your channel? Thank. Oh, great. I'm glad that's helping you out. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in from Alaska. Um, Butch Smith. Less fish you raise. Terry Smith, less fish you raise, the more fish you're trying to save to get exposed to everything that kills salmon. 
Washington is painfully figuring this out, Butch. Oh, Butch. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, I got you. That's what you're saying, Butch Smith. Um, uh oh. Yeah, he's like, gow, gow. Gow. Can you see me or hear me? Yeah, you're, you're, you're froze, my man. Uh, let's see what else we got here. What's up, Ant? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Let's see what do we got here from Travis. Why don't we uh, why don't we do what the Yakima River Basin did and have a tribe build run and own some new hatcheries? The hatcheries would be a success in the eyes of the folks who like lawsuits. Uh, that's true. That's a whole another can of worms. And uh, wow, I mean that would be uh, some of the hatcheries on the um, uh, the coast of Washington. I mean, like the Quinault, they do an amazing job. I mean, those guys raise tons of fish and big fish. Here's stone again. Let's see if we can get them back in. Um, but um, anyway, that that's probably too many, uh, too many things going on. Oh, he's in a different, different, uh, did you move spaces or something? I, I went, I went to my phone, yeah. so that would work. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Travis. Uh, let's see. Uh, have you all read the articles about the effect of chemicals and tires on pre-spawn mortality? Yeah, that just came out. The, it sounded like that was mostly uh, on coho and smaller streams, but um, I, I don't know, James, if you, well, you look frozen again. Um, there you are. What, uh, what do you know about tires and, uh, and uh, the effluent from tires running off into creeks? I don't know that anything's being even talked about here about that, but. I, I think it's discussions and uh, they're bringing it forward to the California advisory committee of salmon, steelhead and trout in California. It's going to be on our next agenda, May 6th. So we're going to get a presentation on it then. And I think um, we'll know more, but yeah, we do know that there are chemicals and tires and the runoff is not, you know, good for natural spawning salmon, but um, there's right. death by a thousand right. cuts. Oh, um, yeah, totally. Um, uh, Matthew, how are we doing on the writing regs on Gibbs minnows? I know last year we were working on replacing that it, that it requires a circle hook. Oh, that'd be cool on Gibbs. <laughs> Have we made any headway on that? I Jane believe the kill rate on snag fish in the upper section of the river. I would not uh, disagree with that. That, um, those fish get, uh, snagged pretty bad in places like the outlet and, uh, um, and then that warm water, even if they're released, which some of them aren't. Um, you know, the mortality rate can't be, uh, can't be very good. Or well, the, the survival rate shouldn't be very good in that warm water after being snagged in the, the tail and fought for, for hours and all that. But do you know anything about reg changes on that, James? Um, I'll just say that our organization is not, uh, engaged in that conversation and we have not been engaged in that conversation yet. Um, we were asked comments on the leader length law that went forward a few years ago. Um, but that, uh, what had to do with, of, uh, Gibbs minnows, we haven't engaged on anything with regulation changes, but I encourage you, if that's what members want, let's have the conversation privately in our group, in our group, and, uh, we can have dialogue and then take it to a meeting and take it to, uh, you know, the future, if people want to see uh, less of that, then, uh, you know, personally, I don't fish like that, but I know there's, I have friends that do. So, uh, depends if you're doing it right. 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 Okay. Good question, Matthew. Uh, Bob Spar, this is a very interesting thing that I think you guys are, uh, had a, or already had a, um, presentation on, or has that happened yet? Yeah, we have, uh, Whoa. Sorry, I, I changed. I changed uh, orientation. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Trying to give you better, better service. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. So tell tell people. Have you have you guys uh, at PFMC had the uh, thiamine? Uh, we did uh, thing yet? Yeah, okay, so fill us in. Yeah, it was it was a big one. It was uh, by uh, Dr. Finley, and uh, it was the the head researcher on thiamine, and had a lot of a uh, lot of things to say. Um, the negative was, is that they think a lot of the natural spawn in 2019 was killed, uh, because of thiamine. Thiamine is basically a B1 deficiency. All animals need to have B1. And basically if you don't eat enough things with B1 in it, you can have a deficiency. And the way that I understand it, that they had to inject B1 into a lot of the hatchery trays and the eggs 
because when the babies were emerging out of the eggs, they were turning on their side and swimming on their sides or upside down and swimming on their sides. And so they noticed it immediately and kudos to CDFW staff uh, at the hatchery for noticing it as well as Coleman staff. Thank you. And uh, they saved millions of fish and they were able to uh, solve the issue in the hatchery um, and save a lot of fish, even though some died. But um, we don't know about the natural spawn. And they believe the thiamine issue is from uh, an anchovy diet. They believe that the adult salmon the last few years have primarily been feeding on anchovies. And this has caused this deficiency. So we're going to find out how bad it is next year, Bob. And we'll know this year when we see how many jacks come back and what escapement is and what abundance is for next year. But uh, the thiamine issue could definitely be, um, you know, a real hurt. And that's one of the re the main issues that we have to consider as fisheries managers um, and helping and members of the public. We have to uh, include that into our management policy and realize that maybe this year, uh, harvest and fall fisheries in the ocean um, or anything else that could hurt us next year might need to be, um, you know, more conservative this year just to protect that future. Yeah. Uh, make sure that instead of managing right to the edge with no wiggle room. Right. Um, speaking of seasons, Doyle's asking, did I hear correctly that Monterey might have a full season? So, yes, and David, this is all uh, might. Yeah. I, oh, I David, sorry. <laughs> yeah, David, I want to reiterate that everything could change, uh, you know, real fast. But um, as of right now, everything is pointing to California recreation having an open season in Monterey this year. Uh, we do not have the winter run impacts that we normally have, and it's mainly a Klamath issue. And so that means that Southern California – Monterey zone, Pigeon Point and below, <laughs> um, that's the farthest south zone, should be a wide open recreational fishery. And I anticipate the commercial fleet being in the Monterey sector at certain times. I don't know about how much time. Uh, the, the impacts on the commercial fleet are far greater than they are for the recreational fleet. They obviously catch a lot more fish. Okay. Yep. Uh, let's see. Robert Mueller, the formula on how many fish are released and how many go into the pumps and Tracy. And that's the season we never get fish release. Yeah, we've looked up that data and we've had a few uh, scientists uh, look up that data for us. And we've actually visited the pumps a couple of times. Um, uh, they they have that data is all public information and it's a, it's a lot, including baby striped bass, baby sturgeon baby bass, baby catfish. I mean, it, you know, water diversion is, is not good for, uh, you know, baby, uh, baby fish migrating out to ocean. Oh boy. He went away again. Well, uh, let's see. We got a few more questions. I'll see if I can hit those. And, and, uh, if James pops back in, that's cool. If not, we'll, uh, let me see. Let's get him back here. Oh, he's gone. All right. Well, um, we've been going for almost two hours here. So um, uh, we were going to do this again soon anyway. So if you got a question, sorry, we're not getting to you, but looks like my man is uh, is gone. So um, let's see if I got anything here. Da, 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 da. Those are good questions. And oh, wait, wait, he's coming back now. He's out. All right. Well, Thanks for tuning in, everybody. It's really uh, good to have you here. Thanks for all the great questions. Sorry we didn't get to the, the last few there. Uh, save those for next time. We will do this again soon um, because there's a lot going on, and this is just going to be a kind of a constantly evolving story. So uh, anyway, thanks for tuning in. And um, if you happen to miss this or somebody you know wants to see this, this will be on uh, my Facebook channel or Facebook. Yeah, I guess it's called channel. Uh, fish with JD, uh, that'll be up there. So if you missed it, you can watch it there. Um, let's see here. I give you that. Uh, where is it? Right there. So you can go to, uh, here it goes. Yeah. So it's right there. Fish with JD on YouTube. This will be there for all of posterity. And, uh, anyway, thanks for tuning in and we will, uh, catch you next time. James, 
thanks for being here. We'll, we'll do it again. I know you got more information, but uh, your signal is uh, no good anymore. So anyway, uh, thanks. Uh, you guys have a good rest of your Sunday. Thanks for sharing it with us this morning, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you next time.